now, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. On behalf of the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, also known as WIPS, I would like to thank you for coming to the first in a two-part series on women's suffrage, featuring Rebecca Boggs Roberts, author of Suffragists in Washington, DC, The 1913 Parade and the Fight for the Vote. This is part of the WIPS Public Issues Series. My name is Julie Bunchek, and I'm a program manager with WIPS. WIPS is a unit of the University of Wisconsin system. Our mission is to engage, educate, and energize communities throughout the state on issues that matter to them. To this end, WIPS task is to provide resources, information, and ideas to empower the people and communities of Wisconsin. If after our program tonight, you are inspired, moved, pleased, or otherwise enjoyed the event, we encourage you to make a donation to WIPS. We are a self-supporting organization and depend on the generosity of our supporters to survive and thrive. Your support will help secure the continuation of WIPS as an organization, as well as ensure future programs like the Public Issues Series. You may visit our website at wipswipps.org and click on Donate. And I'll be sure, be sure to put that link in the chat box. We are delighted to be partnering with the Central Wisconsin Book Festival for the second year in a row. This week of author events has just begun. The entire festival schedule can be found at mcpl.us slash cwbf, and I will also put that link in the chat box. Now here is just a brief video message from the book festival. Welcome to the 2020 Central Wisconsin Book Festival. This week of amazing events is possible only because of the support of our sponsors, which include the Marathon County Public Library, the Friends of the Marathon County Public Library, the MCPL Foundation, the Community Arts Grant Program of the Community Foundation of North Central Wisconsin. With funds provided by the Wisconsin Arts Board, which is a state agency, the Community Foundation, and the BA and Esther Greenheck Foundation, the Wisconsin Institute for Public Policy and Service, the Merco Foundation Fund, Wisconsin Public Radio, the Master Gardener Program of Marathon County, North Central Area Congregations Organized to Make an Impact, or Naomi, and Yonkey Bookstore. Thank you to all of our friends and partners who make the Wisconsin Book Festival possible. And we thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much. Okay, and as I explained uh, at the beginning of the event, we are using Zoom webinar tonight, which means that audience members are not gonna be able to turn on your cameras and microphones. However, you may use the chat function or the Q&A function to submit your questions for our guest, which she and I will go through them when her presentation is done. And our guest tonight has a bio that's uh, very fun to read. Rebecca Boggs Roberts has been many things, including but not limited to journalist, producer, tour guide, forensic anthropologist, event planner, political consultant, jazz singer, and radio talk show host. Currently, she is curator of programming for Planet Word, a museum set to open this year. She looks forward to creating a new institution that will become part of the intellectual and cultural life of our capital city. Roberts lives in Washington, D.C. with her husband, three sons, and a big fat dog. Rebecca, take it away. Thank you, Julie. And thank you all so much for being here tonight and adapting to this strange circumstance and format for a talk. Um, I do have three sons and a big fat dog. Two of them, uh, the twins, started college a month ago. So I'm down to one son um, and we did adopt a second dog. And it's really anyone's guess about who's gonna interrupt the Zoom first. Uh, so everyone, please bear with me. I am of course at home as I'm sure all of you are as well. And so if uh, family life intrudes, I'm sure uh, you all will be understanding. Um, I am delighted to have the chance to talk about the women's suffrage movement. It is, of course, the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment. And a lot of my research has focused on the 20th century part of the movement. I got involved in suffrage as a historical topic because I'm on the board of a historical cemetery here in Washington. And you know, Washington is a planned city. Um, and so there are very original maps of how it was supposed to be laid out. And uh, burial grounds weren't part of those maps. Um, but the uh, cemetery that I'm involved with 
uh, started just after the city did, and so has a lot of the city's history, sort of non-federal, but also federal history, embedded in, in the graves. And on the 90th anniversary of suffrage in 2010, I looked to see if there were enough people involved in the movement, either pro or con, to write a, a set walking tour of the cemetery based on the suffrage issue. And there absolutely were. But what was amazing to me is that when you do research in a cemetery, what you're mainly reading is obituaries. And all of these fancy women, because it was a cemetery for elites, um, when at a time when, you know, nice girls were only in the newspaper for their debut and their marriage and their death, uh, in their obituaries, like woman after woman mentioned marching in this 1913 parade. And either they or their descendants uh, took this opportunity, one of the very rare moments that these women were appearing in a public light to highlight their participation in this 1913 march. And I had never heard of the 1913 suffrage march. I thought that civil rights marches were invented in the 1960s. I didn't know that this idea of creating a issues march, bringing a social justice movement to the corridors of federal power and walking down central DC uh, to highlight the, the issue of the day. I didn't realize it had been invented by suffragists in 1913. So when I started looking into the march, it's beautiful and it's fascinating and it's a real turning point in the movement. And then after the 2016 election, when so many women I knew were planning exactly the same thing, right? A march down the corridors of federal Washington to coincide with the president's inauguration, a president they had not voted for, with the intention of announcing to him on the very first day in office that he ignored women's voices at his peril, the parallels were just too strong to ignore. And um, I've been delighted to be immersed in suffrage history for the last couple of years and the white hot spotlight that the centennial is, is shining on the movement is such an opportunity to share um, not just the stories of the movement, but really how incredibly brave and powerful these women were. So I'm gonna share my screen because one of the wonderful things about doing 20th century research is the photography. Uh, you get very lucky when uh, you get the option of showing these beautiful photographs. So um, I like to start with this image because while the photographs are fantastic, they are of course in black and white and this is the only one that's in color. This is a reproduction of the program of that 1913 March. And I like to use this not just because it shows how colorful the day itself was, all the contemporary accounts of that parade talk about the colors and talk about how um, vibrant the whole look and feel of the, of the march was. But also just look at this whole intentional image, right? There's the Capitol dome in the background. There's this very heroic figure up on her horse. And this gold and purple and white, the colors of the American suffrage movement, they all mean something. Of course they do. White is always purity. Um, Gold is always, um, in fact, it borrows, in this case, from the um, Kansas sunflower. It's very American. Uh, purple is loyalty. Um, but also, boy, do they reproduce well in black and white, right? Uh, purple is a very saturated color. White is a contrast. Gold is somewhere in between. And all of that was completely intentional. These women were really, really good at figuring out how these images would play in the press. Um, and if you see the images from the 1913 parade, they're striking. This is uh, uh, Jane Burleson up on her horse. She was the grand marshal of the parade. Her husband was a cabinet officer. So she was a woman of some prominence in Washington. And uh, again, the Capitol in the background, the legislative branch of government, they were marching right down Pennsylvania Avenue to the executive branch of government, to the White House. Uh, Pennsylvania Avenue is a very convenient place to march. It's very broad. It's got a lot of lanes. It's got big white sidewalks, but also, of course, it's symbolic. Um, you go from one branch to another. It is the heart of federal Washington. And when Alice Paul was planning this parade, the police chief of Washington really didn't want to give her Pennsylvania Avenue. She was planning it for March 3rd, 1913. At the time, the president was always inaugurated on March 4th. And so uh, Woodrow Wilson was going to be sworn into office the next day. And um, the police chief al already felt like his, his force was stretched pretty thin um, and was worried that 
women marching in the street, which in 1913 was transgressive, um, would invite violence. Also, um, this picture is at the like third or fourth street side of, of Pennsylvania Avenue, but at the like 11th, 12th street end of Pennsylvania Avenue, closer to the White House, was what was known as Rum Row, <laughs> all of the bars. And so the police chief was worried that, you know, uh, unruly men plus women stepping out of their comfort zone plus booze probably spelled bad news uh, for this parade. And he kept saying to Alice Paul, can't you choose another route? Can't you come down 16th Street? You'll still end at the White House and it'll be much safer. And she kept saying, I don't want safe. That's not the point. The point is to bring this issue to downtown Washington. And how many parades and marches have we seen since then? Uh, those of us who live here in town now think of marches down Pennsylvania Avenue as a traffic headache, you know, that becomes such a regular occurrence um, that we're sort of annoyed by them. But that tactic was invented by the suffragists, as were so many more. Right behind Jane Burleson on her horse was Inez Milholland on her horse. You might have seen this image a couple of years ago when the women members of Congress wore white to the State of the Union as an homage to the suffragists. And there was a lot of talk about the role of the color white in suffrage. Uh, and this image of Inez Milholland was reproduced a lot. What I take from this image is how incredibly savvy these women were at manipulating the press. Their PR machine was fantastic. We think of this idea of manipulating images as an artifact of the Instagram age. But a hundred years ago, these women were really good at it. Inez Milholland, this woman on the horse, was a labor lawyer. She was an incredibly accomplished professional woman. She was very smart. She was very successful. But the, you know, breathlessly sexist, almost entirely male press of the day always talked about her looks. They called her the most beautiful suffragist. And every time she was mentioned in the press, they talked about how pretty she was. And Alice Paul decided to turn this to advan her advantage. You know, if you're going to talk about her looks instead of her brains, I'm going to put her in a white dress and a white horse and stick a star on her forehead and have her lead my parade. And then maybe you'll take her picture and cover my issue for me. Uh, trivia, by the way, that starry crown was the inspiration for Wonder Woman. So behind uh, the women on horseback, there was this whole incredibly um, elaborate plan of women marching um, by profession. These are the American nurses. Um, the writers marched together, the teachers marched together, they had matching uniforms. It was meant both to be sort of visually striking in its uniformity, but also to very subtly remind the crowd that women were in a lot of fields. They weren't only in the private sphere. There were plenty of public women. Uh, the American women writers who marched together purposely stained their costumes with ink. Um, there were floats representing the history of American women. There were all female marching bands. Um, there were uh, representatives from the few nations that allowed women to vote and the few states that allowed women to vote. It was thousands and thousands of people and it was enormously well planned. And again, we're still here at the Capitol end of Pennsylvania Avenue, that's where everybody began. And it was all timed out so that the head of the parade would hit 15th Street it's convenient here in Washington. It's a planned city that the streets are numbered. You start at 1st Street, you end at 15th Street. Um, and of course, 16th Street, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue is the White House. So one block short of that is the Treasury Building. And the Treasury Building, then as now, has this very broad marble plaza in front of it, which is a pretty great stage. So there was a pageant, a tableau vivant, staged on the treasury steps. And it was a sort of tortured allegory of Columbia summoning the virtues. That's Columbia there in her armor. And the virtues she summoned were like hope and peace and prosperity. And uh, it had very little to do with suffrage, frankly, but boy, did it look great in pictures. I mean, she is still the cover of my book 100 years later. And this pageant involved children in togas and balloons and at least a couple of live doves. And it was quite a production. And the whole plan was that the pageant would finish just as the head of the parade was reaching the treasury steps. And the participants in the pageant would stand there in dignified silence. The parade would process in front of them. They would fold into the end of the parade. They would all proceed together to DAR Hall. The pageant would perform again in front of a triumphant crowd. And it would be this wonderful capstone to a perfect day. And it all started without a hitch. 
the parade began, the signal went down Pennsylvania Avenue that the parade had begun, the pageant begins, they do their thing, they're standing there on the treasury steps and they wait for the parade and there's no parade. And they wait a little longer and they think, okay, maybe we finished a little faster than we should have. We'll wait a little minute until the uh, head of the parade comes by. It should be in a minute. And they keep waiting and there's no parade. Now it's March 3rd in Washington, which can be kind of chilly. It wasn't a bad day for March 3rd. Uh, we've certainly had worse, but these people were barefoot on marble steps. <laughs> so they got cold and they went inside the treasury building to wait and there was no sign of the parade. And they had no way of knowing where the parade was. They didn't understand why the parade wasn't showing up. And they couldn't look down Pennsylvania Avenue to see because they were at a right angle. All that was in front of them was a grandstand that had been set up for Wilson's inauguration the next day. Alice Ball had gotten permission for her VIPs to sit there. And they thought, okay, we'll just wait inside the Treasury Department and figure out what happens when the parade comes by. But where on earth is the parade? What is going on? Well, this is what was going on. So again, for perspective, this picture is taken at about 13th or 14th Street on Pennsylvania Avenue, looking back towards the Capitol Dome in the distance. That tower on the right was then the post office. It's now the Trump Hotel. And this is, uh, it's actually an advantage to do this by Zoom instead of me projecting this image at the end of a grand ballroom. You can see the detail there. That is shoulder to shoulder. Pennsylvania Avenue still is a very broad street and you can't see daylight between those people. And if you look closely, it's a lot of bowler hats. Those are men. They weren't there for the suffrage parade. The suffrage parade was a sideshow. They were there for the Wilson inauguration and they blocked the parade route and they behaved incredibly badly. They insulted the women, they tripped them, uh, they threw things at them, uh, they hurled epithets at them. The police did absolutely nothing to control this crowd. In some cases, the police joined in the name calling and the tripping. And you can't get a parade down this crowd. There's no way. So ultimately, um, Alice Paul tried to drive a car into the middle of this crowd. She was expecting to march with the college graduate women. She was in academic robes. She was expecting to uh, join her fellow Swarthmore grads. And uh, she drove a car down this crowd and sort of zigzagged up and down the route, hoping it would push people back. And it didn't work at all. The crowd just folded right back into the street as soon as she had driven by. And they had to call in the cavalry, literally. They had mounted officers standing by. Uh, and they rode into the crowd from this end, from where this picture is taken, the 14th Street end. And they rode their horses into the crowd, which is, you know, not subtle, but it's fairly effective. And it pushed the crowd back long enough uh, to allow the parade to proceed. But by the time the parade fought its way through this crowd, joined up with the pageant participants, got to the DAR hall at the end. Instead of it being this triumphant moment, every single one of these women was insulted, cold, filthy, furious, horrified. These jerky men had ruined this perfectly planned, beautiful day. And Alice Paul recognized from the very beginning, it was the best thing that ever could have happened. That a beautiful parade would have been in the news for a day and a near riot was gonna keep the suffrage cause in the news for weeks. And that's exactly what happened. And I can't help but see the parallels to activism today. There's so many parallels to activism today. I'm happy to talk more about that. But uh, you know, this summer, when the Black Lives Matter protest was here in Washington, and they were in Lafayette Square on the north side of the White House, and um, law enforcement cleared that square with questionable tactics in order to make uh, room for the president to stand in front of St. John's Church, had, um, you know, law enforcement sort of let that protest play out and everyone went home at curfew, it would have been a one day news cycle. And instead, uh, the misadventures of law enforcement and the uh, suspect motivations of um, the executive branch kept that story in the news for weeks. And that's exactly what happened here. So this is uh, the Chicago Daily Tribune the next day. This headline should have been, by all rights, Woodrow Wilson inaugurated the nation's 28th president, right? But it's super not. Wilson gets his far right column. The column on the left there, mobs at Capitol defy police, 
Block suffrage parade, guards powerless before mass, hoodlums hurl caustic remarks at the marchers. And then there's paragraph after paragraph about the mistreatment of the crowd. But also look at that editorial cartoon. There's Woodrow Wilson thinking on his very first day as president, he gets the spotlight, but instead, ta-da, there's a suffragist with equal suffrage on her hat, literally blocking his spotlight from his very first day in office. So the reason, there are several reasons I'm fascinated by the 1913 parade. It was a spectacle. It is beautiful. It is an amazing organization uh, in a pre-digital age, the fact that they got all those women to town and found them places to stay and organized all of the things they needed to organize amazed me. It also really was a shot in the arm for a movement that desperately needed one. The suffrage movement was languishing by 1913, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, it also uh, recruited new women to the cause. It was something to do. Uh, it was a tactic that felt appealing. And so uh, younger women in particular who had not been particularly excited by the suffrage cause got involved because of the march. But tactically, it was also an announcement that the federal amendment was back on the table and that Washington was going to be the central place where suffrage was gonna be played out. And why was that an issue? So now I'm gonna rip through about 65 years of history and I'm gonna do it really fast. So if I breeze through something you want to know more about, please post a question in the chat or in the Q&A because uh, this is going to go by quickly. So if you date the beginning of the suffrage movement to the Seneca Falls Convention, and there are arguments to be made that it should be earlier, but let's go with Seneca Falls because the suffragists themselves encourage that as their origin myth. The Seneca Falls Convention was in 1848. It was much earlier than people realize. And so it was before the Civil War, um, much generations before the women that ultimately succeeded in passing suffrage led that fight. And a lot of women at that time, the early 19th century women, came to suffrage because they were abolitionists. And what they really wanted was abolition and realized they probably couldn't get that done without having the vote. So the vote was a means to an end. It wasn't a civil rights issue in and of itself. And they were right, frankly, right? I mean, uh, men in charge abolished slavery through war. So when the Civil War broke out, uh, first of all, all suffragists suspended suffrage activity during the war. And then in the wake of the Civil War, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were ratified in quick succession. And those, the 13th Amendment outlaws slavery. The 14th Amendment defines people born in the US as citizens, but limits uh, citizenship to male citizens. It's the first time the word male appears in the Constitution. And then the 15th Amendment enfranchises black men. And there were those in the suffrage movement, people like uh, Julia Ward Howe and Alice Stone and uh, Frederick Douglass, who said, we're abolitionists, we're gonna take the 15th Amendment in franchising black men, and then we're gonna fight for women next. This is important. We're gonna take this step by step. And there were people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony who said, if we take the 15th Amendment as written in franchising black men and no women, it's going to be another generation before women even have the chance to be considered. And we cannot support the 15th Amendment as written. And it caused a huge rift in the movement. They formed separate organizations, um, the Stone, Blackwell, Douglas uh, faction forming the American Woman Suffrage Association, Stanton and Anthony forming the National Suffrage Association. And um, they actually competed with each other. They fought each other for fund funders, they tore each other down in the press. Um, but most important, they sought different tactics. The um, Stone Blackwell group went state by state, and the Stan and Anthony group went for a federal amendment. The state by state strategy, it's not crazy, it's exhausting and it's expensive, and it requires a huge amount of grassroots work. Uh, but the theory was that if enough states enfranchised women, then enough men in Congress would represent women that uh, a federal amendment would be inevitable, that the members of Congress would make it happen. 
And it was also a little bit of a hedge against Southern states who were smarting from the Reconstruction Amendments, who felt that the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were federal overreach. And these suffragists felt that uh, Southern states probably wouldn't go for another big federal effort. And in fact, sometimes went into those Southern states with overtly racist arguments. The state-by-state state, uh, strategy sometimes included suffragists going into the Deep South and saying, if you enfranchise women, you ensure white supremacy because there are so many more white women than there are black men or women. Enfranchise us and you ensure white supremacy. Every place that argument was used, it didn't work, by the way. The South was systematically disenfranchising black male voters with Jim Crow laws that was working for them. They were not interested in enfranchising women of any color. But so these different strategies also slowed the movement way down. And the state-by-state -state strategy wasn't working very well. Uh, at the turn of the century, only a very few states allowed women to vote. Um, Wyoming was the first, Montana, Idaho, these great big empty states out west where at the time like 11 people were living and so they were enfranchising everybody in order to maximize their political power. Um, but in the more populous states, suffrage failed over and over. And so it was hard to get behind it as a young activist. If you were a young woman at the turn of the century, you might think, yeah, it would be nice to have the vote, but God, that movement, it's just going nowhere. Even Harriet Stanton Blatch, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, said it was a movement that bored its adherents and appalled its opponents, which is super not where you wanna be as a social justice movement. It's just not a recipe for success. So the 1913 parade injected new life into this moribund movement, gave people something to do, gave young women something to be excited about, and also announced that this federal amendment was back. Those two factions did reunite by the 1890s. Um, they were back together at this point, but they were very cautious and they were very gun shy and they had decided to pursue that state by state strategy instead of the federal amendment. Um, Alice Paul was exactly the kind of woman who you might have expected to be involved in suffrage. She had grown up in New Jersey. She was a Quaker. She had been imbued with the values of equality uh, on a theoretical level from the time she could understand the Quaker service but she had never been involved in the women's suffrage movement in America. It didn't really say anything to her. And then she went to England for grad school. And in England, she was radicalized because the British suffrage movement did have its slow, steady, color within the lines movement. But then they also had the Pankhursts. The Pankhursts, mother Emmeline and daughter Sylvia and Christabel were this militant, almost guerrilla faction of suffrage activists. The faction of American suffragists that Alice Paul will go on to found, the National Women's Party, is occasionally referred to as the militant branch of the American suffrage movement. They had nothing on the British movement. The American militants, as so-called militants, never broke a single law. The British militants were throwing bricks through windows. They were smacking policemen in the face to get arrested on purpose. At one point, they tried to set the prime minister's house on fire. They were not kidding around. And I use this, um, these two juxtaposing news articles to illustrate this. So um, this column on the left, trouble expected in London tonight, suffragettes determined to force their way into parliament movement after dark. Ms. Panker says the women will certainly break into the house. It was completely expected that the Pankhurst wing of the suffrage movement was going to wreak destruction. Uh, this artifact on the right is an ad in a Edinburgh newspaper. Suffragettes may break windows, but I'm the wee boy who can put them in. It's an ad for a glazier advertising his services to replace your windows if suffragettes have broken them. By the way, suffragist, suffragette, the word is suffragist. The British press made fun of the activists in England, particularly the Pankhurst wing of the activists. Uh, by patronizing them, calling them suffragettes. Oh, you cute little suffragette. It was meant as an insult. And those activists co-opted the name, used it for their own power, as many activist movements have done uh, in the years since. So most properly, the word is suffragist. Suffragette refers to the British movement, even specifically the militant wing of the British movement. 
So Alice Paul gets radicalized in England. Uh, she becomes active in Pankhurst's army. She's arrested. Uh, Pankhurst had instructed all of her followers that if they were arrested to demand political prisoner status, and when it was denied, as it routinely was, uh, to go on a hunger strike. Hunger strikes as a tactic really didn't work for the men in authority, right? These were women, uh, almost entirely white women, uh, almost entirely upper middle class white women, getting frail and bony and starving looking in jail at the hands of these brutal men uh, was not an optic that they wanted to encourage. And so they force fed the women. And force feeding is just as horrifying as it sounds. It's, it's torture. There's really no other way to describe it. A, a two, your, your jaw, you're held down, your jaw is forced open. Uh, if you clench your jaw, your teeth are broken. Um, if, if you continue to clench your jaw, maybe the tube is forced down your nose. And uh, liquid nutrition is sent down a tube, and then the entire tube is yanked out, bloody and painfully. So Alice Paul endured this in England's jails. And before we feel too smug about that, she endured it in American jails too, right here in Washington, DC. So she was a little bit of a celebrity. Um, Emmeline Pankhurst really knew how to fundraise. She was great at that. And so she knew she had this lovely young American woman uh, as a martyr to the cause. And she came here to, to America and fundraised on Alice Paul's imprisonment. So by the time Alice Paul came back to America, she was sort of a mini celebrity. Reporters met her boat at the dock. Um, so the fact that she sort of dreamed up this 1913 parade as a tactic for the American movement, um, at first the leaders of the American movement who had taken over from Stanton and Anthony, the next generation, Carrie Chapman Catt and Anna uh, Howard Shaw, were delighted to have some new ideas. But they were very nervous from the very beginning that um, Alice Paul would adopt more and more tactics of the Pankhurst movement and push the envelope and become more outrageous. And they were right, frankly. So she launches the parade in 1913. 1914, she starts publishing uh, a competing newsletter from the National. She starts poaching some donors, most notably Alva Belmont. Um, she uh, starts going rogue, frankly. So by 1915, the National kicks her out and she forms the National Women's Party as a competing organization. 1916 was a terrible year for suffrage. Um, every state that had suffrage on the ballot voted it down. Woodrow Wilson was reelected. Woodrow Wilson was against suffrage on a federal level. He came up with many increasingly lame reasons to be against that, and I'm happy to answer questions about that, but he was frankly against federal suffrage. And he was reelected, not by a lot, but he was reelected in 1916. And then the other thing that happened in 1916 is Inez Milholland, she of the white dress on the white horse, collapsed on stage giving a speech. She was one of their best public speakers. And um, she died in the hospital a few days after her speech. And her last words, her sister reported, were, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? So as 1917 dawned, the National Women's Party sort of looked at each other and thought, we can't do another petition drive. We can't do another parade. We can't do another thing we've already done. We need something new. The president's back in office. We gained no states in the election. And one of our best, most bright light public speakers has died literally giving a speech for the cause. We need to do something new. And they come up with this idea of picketing the White House. Now, if you go to the north, this is the north side of the White House on Lafayette Square. If you go there on any given day, not during a pandemic, there's always someone standing out there with a sign. It has now become so regular to pick at the White House that it's, I, I think the anti-nuclear people more or less live there. No one had ever done it before. It's hard to describe how shocking and transgressive this was among women in 1917. But again, look at the image. Look at how planned this is. These women in their dark coats against the White House with the banners all at the same uh, height and the sashes all at the same angle. And that banner says, Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Inez Milholland's, maybe, last words. In a very easy to read, sans serif font against a light background, totally intentional, easily reproduced in newspaper pictures. 
But the plan for the pickets in 1917 was never to keep it up forever. They just thought they'd do it for two months. And then when Wilson was inaugurated for a second term in March of 1917, they'd have one last grand picket. And they'd go around the White House and then they'd go meet with Wilson and they could move on to another tactic because everything gets stale after a while. And March 3rd, 1917, unlike 1913, was one of those gross early spring days where it's like raining sideways and there's a terrible wind and everything's just bitingly cold. And the contemporary accounts of these women picketing talk about the wood stain they'd used on the poles holding their banners dripping down the insides of their wrists inside their gloves. You can just imagine how gross it was. And so they march around the White House grounds and they go to meet with the president and the gate is barred to them. They try every single gate around the White House property and they're not allowed in. So they keep marching. They circle the entire White House property four times, which is quite a big property. And they go back to na the National Women's Party headquarters on Lafayette Square, just, just north of the White House. And they say, you know what? We're not going to stop the pickets. If he won't meet with us, if he won't talk to us, we're going to keep holding his feet to the fire. So throughout March and April of 1917, they keep showing up with pickets. By the end of April 1917, we're now involved in World War I. Now what do you do? Do you keep criticizing the president during wartime? Some people think that's treasonous. That is definitely going to lose you some public support. The bigger organization, the National American Woman Suffrage Association, they didn't suspend suffrage work, uh, but they encouraged their members to do war work at the same time. The British movement totally suspended suffrage work. Now, England was under a much more direct existential threat than America was, but the British movement decided they could not um, pursue suffrage during World War I. The National Women's Party thought about it and they thought, you know, we lost a lot of time by suspending our work during the Civil War. We have a lot of members who are against this war and we wanna give them a place where they can feel free to express this. But most importantly, what was the US involvement in World War I about? It was about making the world safe for democracy, right? That's what Woodrow Wilson said. He was giving a speech a minute on the international stage about how vital representative democracy was. And at the same time, he remained this massive roadblock to the enfranchisement of half of his own citizens. And the women of the National Women's Party just thought that hypocrisy could not stand, that they needed to be out there pointing out to the president that everything he said about democracy was in fact true. And it was true for the female citizens of his own country. By the way, you will never hear me say that women were given the vote. First of all, they fought incredibly hard for it, but also they were citizens. We are citizens. We had the right to vote. It was just not until 1920 that the men in power recognized that fact. So no one was given anything. So the National Women's Party continues the pickets throughout 1917. And not only do they keep going, they lean in. <laughs> and again, if you look at contemporary activist uh, platforms, this is a tweet, right? This is the 1917 version of making a message go viral. It's a little hard to read. It says, to the Russian envoys, President Wilson and Envoy Root are deceiving Russia. They say, we are a democracy. Help us win a world war so that democracies may survive. We, the women of America, tell you that America is not a democracy. 20 million American women are denied the right to vote. President Wilson is the chief opponent of their national enfranchisement. Help us make this nation really free. Tell our government that it must liberate its people before it can claim free Russia as an ally. This is a very direct uh, criticism of the president during wartime. And as predicted, the crowds did turn against them. Here's somebody tearing down the Russian envoy banner. The police never did anything to stop this, by the way. Uh, the women, instead of being intimidated by this behavior, they, they leaned in. <laughs> this is the Kaiser Wilson banner. Kaiser Wilson, have you forgotten your sympathy with the poor Germans because they were not self-governed? 20 million American women are not self-governed. Take the beam out of your own eye. So now these activists are comparing uh, the president to a Kaiser while we're at war with Germany. And finally, the president has had it. He says to local law enforcement, get them off my sidewalk, get rid of them. They were not breaking any laws. Every so often you'll read something that says they chained themselves to the White House fence. They never did. They just stood there with signs. 
this was the progressive era. There was a lot of labor unrest. Picketing was 100% legal. Nothing these women were doing was against any sort of a law. But the president had had it, local law enforcement had had it. So they round all the women up and arrest them. And there's this sort of Keystone Cops moment where they try to figure out what to charge them with. And finally come up with this idea that they have broken the law of obstructing traffic on the sidewalk, which is not a thing. It's 100% not against any sort of statute. Um, but it's a bluff, right? So the judge says to the women, um, you can pay a $5 fine or you can spend a night in jail. Assuming that all of them will say, oh, heaven forfend, I can't possibly go to jail. Here's my $5, I'll never do it again. And retreat with their tails between their legs. But that was underestimating these women as so many men did in this history. And every single one of them said, fine, I'll go to jail, no problem. There's 30 women who will pick up the pickets tomorrow. So they go to jail. The next day, there are plenty more picketers out there. They're all arrested. They're all charged on this bogus charge. The judge says, $5 fine or, I don't know, three nights in jail. Every single one of the women, fine, I'll go to jail, no problem. This escalates so crazily through the summer and fall of 1917 that these women are being sentenced routinely to 60 days in the workhouse for standing on a corner with a sign, which is not, in fact, against any law. Repeat offenders like Alice Paul and Lucy Burns are getting months long sentences in jail for not breaking any laws. Alice Paul at one point was being held in the DC jail and they sent a psychiatrist hoping that she would be declared insane so they could institutionalize her and get her out of the way. As it happened, that psychiatrist was an honest man and came up with one of my favorite quotes from this era, which is, courage in women is often mistaken for insanity. And for the most part, the women were sent to the DC jail, but now and then they were sent down to a workhouse in Occoquan, Virginia. And there was a night in um, the fall of 1917 where a bunch of women were arrested. And for the most part, when they went to Occoquan, they were kept in this sort of communal area. It was one of those progressive era work will make you free models of penal system where the inmates you know, made the bricks and made, you know, tended the garden and sewed their uniforms and cooked the food. And so the women were sort of held in, a, in this group area together. But this night, the warden had had it. And he uh, ordered his guards to bodily lift the women up and they take them away from the open communal area and throw them into punishment cells. And the punishment cells were these unlit, unheated cinder block cells with open sewage um, and rats and darkness and freezing cold. And the women were bodily hurled into these cells. Uh, Dora Lewis smacked her head on the cinder block and passed out. Her cellmate thought she was dead and had a heart attack. Lucy Burns, who was one of the activists arrested that night, starts calling the women's names out in the darkness to call Roll to see who's okay. The guard shouted her to stop calling Roll and she refuses. So they chain her with her arms above her head in her dark cell overnight for standing on a corner with a sign which is not against any law. So when news about this night gets out, as of course it does, it becomes known as the night of terror. And public opinion starts to sway back in favor of the women, that even if you don't agree with all their tactics, even if you're not totally sure about women voting, that this violent, aggressive treatment for, it just doesn't, the punishment doesn't fit the crime in any way and it's un-American. The other major, major thing that happens in the fall of 1917 is New York passes suffrage. It was the most populous state at the time. And so a bunch of fence sitters see the writing on the wall, right? They think, well, it kind of looks like women are gonna vote. They might as well vote for me. And magically a bunch of people change their mind and realize that perhaps um, you know, the nation won't go directly to hell if women are enfranchised. Even the president, even Woodrow Wilson starts to admit that maybe federal enfranchisement is not a terrible, terrible thing. So as 1918 dawns, it looks like maybe the federal amendment might actually happen, except it doesn't. It passes the House and not the Senate. But the 1918 midterms bring in a whole new uh, population. Um, a bunch of Democrats lost, Woodrow Wilson was not popular, um, and a bunch of Republicans capitalized on the idea of suffrage, that um, if there were gonna be this whole new generation of women, voting, uh, maybe they could all be Republicans. Maybe the Republican party could blame the Democrats 
for being a roadblock on the way to suffrage. And maybe those women would register as Republicans as they joined uh, the voting ranks. So 1918 brings in a Republican majority in both chambers of Congress, including many, many pro-suffrage uh, men. So in 1919, the amendment finally passes both chambers. 1919 was first introduced uh, 62 years earlier. Now it goes to the states for ratification. There were 48 states at the time, two thirds means 36. This is Alice Paul sewing a star on her banner. Every time a new state ratified, she'd add a star to her banner. Wisconsin can lay claim to being the very first state to ratify the 19th Amendment. Michigan and Illinois can lay that claim too. They all did it the same day. Uh, so I'll let you all fight it out amongst yourselves there in the Midwest. But Wisconsin, Michigan, Illinois uh, ratified right away. A few states declined right away, all in the South, all for overtly racist reasons. They were not afraid to say, we do not want to enfranchise a single new black voter. Uh, we are systematically disenfranchising black men. We don't want black women. Then there were a bunch of states who wouldn't bring it to a vote for specific reasons. It was an off year, they needed a special session, special sessions are expensive. Sometimes the governor maybe had passed some controversial legislation at the end of the last session, didn't wanna give his legislature a chance to revisit that. There were a lot of sort of inside baseball reasons why some states wouldn't bring it to a vote. By the summer of 1920, 35 states have ratified, only one one more needed, especially if women are going to be able to vote in the 1920 general election, which was the goal. So 35 have ratified. That leaves 13. Of the 13 left on the table, five won't bring it to a vote at all. That leaves eight. Six have voted it down. Only two states left, North Carolina and Tennessee. The way the South has been going, neither of those look like a great prospect, but okay. North Carolina votes it down. It's all down to Tennessee. It is August of 1920. It's really hot in Nashville in August. Everyone shows up in Nashville, everyone. All the pro-suffrage forces, all the anti-suffrage forces, the Catholic Church, the Civil War veterans, the liquor lobby who really doesn't want women to vote. They're all staying at the same hotel. They're all at the Hermitage Hotel in downtown Nashville. The liquor lobby sets up what they call the Jim Beam suite to get members too drunk to vote. The entire national press corps is there. They're all in each other's faces. Pro-suffrage folks are wearing a yellow rose in their lapels. Aunties are wearing red roses. Some people are wearing both. At least one member wore that variety of rose that's yellow with a red rim around it. No one's got a good whip count of how this is gonna go. There's terrible dirty politicking on both sides. People getting calls saying, oh, you need to head back to Knoxville. Your son is sick. You know, people sending a pretty girl to take someone out to dinner so he'll stay in town. It's all just a mess. No one knows how this is going to go. Last state, last possibility. The state Senate votes yes. It's down to the state assembly. A few days before the actual vote, there's a vote that could be seen as a proxy for how it's going to go. And it's a tie. We're down to the last chamber of the last state, and it's a tie. A tie's a loss. You have to win to win. So it's finally the actual day of the actual vote. No one knows what's gonna happen. A huge amount's riding on this. Everyone's in this state house in Nashville, but no one knows what's gonna happen. And one guy changes his mind, Harry Byrne. Harry Byrne was a very young member of the assembly. No one had him in the yes column. His mentor in the assembly was one of those troglodytes of the, you know, women are too stupid and fragile to handle the vote variety. And literally with a red rose in his lapel, he changes his mind and votes yes. And that's all it takes. One guy changing his mind. That entire national press board, they all descend on him, right? Mr. Byrne, you changed your mind. Mr. Byrne, you changed your vote. Mr. Byrne, the women of America now have the franchise because of you. What made the difference? What made you change your mind? And he pulls out a letter from his mom. His mom told him to. He had this letter in his coat pocket. This is a terrible reproduction, but in the center there it says, hurrah and vote for suffrage and don't keep them in doubt. And little Harry Byrne says to this assembled press corps, I really think a good boy does what his mama tells him to do. 
And that's what it took. One guy changing his vote, the last chamber at the last house. Alice Paul was able to sew the final star on her suffrage banner and hang it out of National Women's Party headquarters here in Washington, DC, uh, August 26, 1920, just a little over 100 years ago. And that is the story. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn to uh, the chat. And I encourage you all to ask me questions. That was a, a lot of history I ripped right through there. So um, anything you'd like me to focus on more or any parallels to the contemporary women's movement or any other activism, I'm more than happy to help them. Well, Rebecca, I, well, first of all, that was a fantastic, fantastic presentation. Um, again, the book is, um, has, has all these photos and many, many more. So it's it, just a fascinating read. Um, if you happen to be in Wausau, they have it uh, in stock at Yankee Bookstore. Okay. Um, but you know, one thing I wanted to, you talked about the role of, of race in, uh, in the suffrage movement early on. Can you talk a little bit about, about the situation for women of color who wanted to be part of the parade? Yeah, so I am not proud of the suffragist record on race. I think that this is one of those um, areas where it's very tempting as a historian of women's history to elevate these women to some sort of a you know, saintly platform to prove that they deserve to be in the canon among men. But they weren't saints, just as the men weren't. And they made some huge respect, mistakes. Um, uh, I mentioned the racist arguments many suffragists made on the state-by-state -state platform. Specifically in the parade, there was a sorority here at Howard that formed um, specifically to be more politically active. The sororities that were in existence at the time were more socially focused and Delta Sigma Theta with Mary Church Terrell as their advisor wanted to create a group for women who were more politically active. And they wanted their very first act as a sorority to be to march in the 1913 parade. And Alice Paul panicked. She thought that white women would balk at a segregated parade. And she didn't answer their request for weeks, which is very unlike her. She was very efficient. And finally, she suggested that they march at the back in a segregated section. Now, I've spoken to many current Deltas uh, who are very aware of this history. This is very much their origin myth. And they say that the story has been handed down that Deltas marched where they wanted to march. Um, sadly, pictures don't survive. I will tell you that Ida B. Wells, the uh, muckraking journalist from Illinois, did march with the Illinois general, uh, delegation. She was not interested in marching in a segregated section at the back. She waited with the crowd until the Illinois delegation came by and joined her white colleagues there. Um, but it was one of many, many, many times when white suffragists ignored the needs of black suffragists. And uh, people like Mary Church Terrell, who had like four master's degrees and spoke six languages and, um, you know, passed all of the status symbols that white suffragists wanted her to pass in order to include them, would often be the only woman of color at some of these meetings and would say, yeah, no, I'm actually black and you need to pay attention to these needs. Um, but it was an ignored voice over and over again. And so people like Ida B. Wells formed the Alpha Suffrage Club, uh, which was specifically for Black women because they felt that their voices couldn't be heard in these mainstream white movements. Um, but like so much else, I think that the, the attention on the movement for this centennial is encouraging so much scholarship about issues like this, that we are finally bringing these stories to the forefront um, and learning um, about not just the women who led um, all these different movements for Black women, for Native American women, for Latino women, for immigrant women, many of whom were left out of the 19th Amendment, um, but also the limits of the heroes that are held up, right? They're not perfect. They are in many ways very, very flawed. Um, and I would love to pretend they were perfect um, because I admire them, but they super weren't. And actually it's really bad history to pretend they were. Um, uh, I also actually, frankly, find it liberating, Julie, to discover how flawed these women were because it means we can change the world too, right? We and all of our flaws uh, can accomplish things. I love that. Yes. Being perfect. Right. We have a question from Lucy who is wondering, who is your favorite person that you learned about during your research for this book? So I have to say, I have a fondness for the women who are funny. <laughs> 
Alice Paul was really, really impressive, but I think she was sort of terrifying. I mean, she was so single-minded of purpose that she's not exactly the kind of woman you'd want like a glass of wine and a good gossip with. She was as impressive as you can imagine. And I admire the hell out of her, but I probably wouldn't have enjoyed her company very much. I see no evidence of a sense of humor of her at all. Whereas someone like um, Dora Stevens, who wrote uh, Jail for Freedom, is hilarious. And uh, some of the women who compiled the card catalog. So the National Women's Party, you know, they get a lot of press for being the radical wing of the movement and for doing these publicity stunts like picketing the White House. But they did their homework too. They weren't all flash. Um, and they had this crazy card catalog where they had 20, 25 cards on every member of Congress listing every time he had ever voted on suffrage, whether his members, members of his family were supported it, anything he had um, said that might be useful to uh, lobby him, where he went to church, where he played golf. And the notes on some of those cards are amazing. They'll say things like, you know, he's a drunk, talk to him before it's five o'clock, <laughs> or uh, his wife is actually the brains of the operation, talk to her instead. <laughs> and, you know, you go through and you're so impressed with the diligence of the research on those cards, but also how frank and funny those women were. Well, and just, you know, one thing that, that struck me as, as I read the book is that this would make an amazing movie. And, and, and it, this story has been told um, yeah. in, in film form, but, you know, the, the story about the card catalog, you know, that would be, you know, very, very light and, you know, that would be, you know, comedic relief. And, and sadly, the movies aren't great. So okay. there's one called uh, Iron Jawed Angels with Hilary Swank as Alice Paul. Yeah. It's, it's a little terrible. I mean, you know, they invent a love interest for her because you need the dramatic tension of all that. It's, it's got some core of decent history, but most of it just sort of annoys you. The, I think the better movie actually is called Suffragette, which is about the British movement with Meryl Streep as Emmeline Pankhurst, which is such spectacular casting. And Helena and, Bonham Carter as someone, I don't remember who, but yes. And the, the main character, the first person narrator in that movie is fictional, but the things that happened to her, the events that occurred during the suffrage women in England are real. So it's a better historical fiction if you're looking for something. It's called Suffragette. So, so the, the scene that, that would have had me on the edge of my seat, and as I was reading it, I thought, okay, this, I don't know, I would maybe change it. I would maybe take a little liberty. Maybe Tennessee wouldn't be the last state. Or at least the, 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 the West Virginia, the, 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 the representative. Oh, so they locked themselves in the state house and wouldn't, yeah. Or, yes, because the, the, I'll, I'll let you tell it. The one, the one representative was in California and... Right. So West Virginia, they um, they needed this one member to get back to vote, but he was in California. And at the time, California to West Virginia was a many days train journey. So they basically locked themselves in the state house and they wouldn't let anyone leave until this guy could show up. And there's there's actually crazy sort of mini stories state by state like that uh, in Connecticut, where you would think Connecticut would have gone for suffrage, just like a lot of Northeastern states did, but the senator from Connecticut was one of those um, died in the wool sexists. And he, um, so he was gonna lose. If women got the vote, he was gonna lose. But he was the pet senator of the railroad industry. He was the guy who put like all the um, earmarks for the railroads on different appropriations bills. So now you had that, railroad industry funding the anti-suffrage movement in Connecticut just to keep Brandon G in power. Um, actually, that's another one of my favorite quotes. One of the suffragists said, Senator Brandon G is like antique furniture. He's interesting to look at, but he's not for everyday use. <laughs> great. We have a great question here from Cheryl. Uh, she said, were any working class women involved in the suffrage movement? And were they considered less important, than, less important than the wealthy women? You know, I think the class questions about the movement are fascinating. You can't pick at the White House if you need to be at your factory job, right? Like the, the movement had a reputation, even at the time, of being the privilege of club ladies. Uh, and particularly the bigger organization, the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Uh, one of the things the National Women's Party tried to do was break down some of those class barriers um, and encourage socialist women, working class women 
um, to get involved in the movement for their own self-interest. You can imagine the vote would matter even more if you were economically responsible for your family. Um, but the movement for sure had a class problems, particularly in the 19th century. It was definitely something that, um, you know, women with the wherewithal and the freedom to have the time to, to spend on it um, were the ones who were involved. There are plenty of examples of uh, women in charge being dismissive of working class women in the movement. There are also plenty of counterexamples of uh, working class movement being elevated to positions of leadership and recognizing that women who were um, earning paychecks, who were out in the public sphere, uh, had an even more vital stake in the vote. Um, and I also think that you can't underestimate World War I in here, right? So, um, so much of the opposition to suffrage had to do with it being sort of shocking and unsettling to see women in the public sphere. And then World War I broke down so many of those barriers because women had to take those jobs because the men were overseas. And so it became not just a sort of overt thank you to American women for their war work, but just socially changed so many attitudes about what was an appropriate role for women um, across classes because they had to get out of the house um, because of World War I. So uh, it's difficult to kind of parse race and class in this country, right? So I wouldn't say that the issues around race and the issues around class are separate things. Um, but if you're talking about white working class women, um, there's a very interesting history there and it changed a lot in the last few, few years of the movement. Um, I see a private question here that asks, did the American movement arise before or after the movement in England and did one inspire the other? So I touched on this a little bit in terms of Alice Paul being inspired by the English movement. They arose more or less at the same time, but had very different uh, tactics. And the English um, movement, because they were so aggressive and so in your face, those tactics were sort of interestingly co-opted by the American movement. But uh, also England or the UK did in fact enfranchise women first. So uh, British women got the vote in 1917 but weirdly, there was this sort of grandfather clause where women were aged in in stage steps because so many young men had been lost in World War I that the men in power were worried that young women would have a disproportionate influence in the vote because there weren't enough young men to counter their voice. And so uh, initially, when British women were given the vote, it was women over 35 only. And then the next sort of cohort was graduated in election by election. Okay. Um, and a question from Eric, what were some of the religious connections with the movement? Were some churches or congregations leading the charge either for or against? Yeah, the religious role of the movement was huge and it was almost entirely against. Um, there are very few mainstream American religions that aren't sexist, and certainly very few that weren't sexist 100 years ago. Um, now, I have to say, the anti-suffrage arguments are more nuanced than you might think, right? There was certainly the garden variety, women can't handle the vote, but you were never gonna change those people's minds. That was not the interesting part of the anti-suffrage voice. Um, then there were, industries that feared women voters, right? Anyone who employed child labor, the liquor lobby, things like that. But the most interesting anti-suffragists to me were women themselves who under, and you saw this argument echoed again a generation later in the ERA fight. Women who said, women own the private sphere. It's vital. We raise children, we support the family, we keep the home going. It couldn't be more important. We should own that and be proud of it and asking to be part of the men's sphere, of the public sphere, is denigrating the importance of our role at home. And we should not undermine our own value by asking to be part of this other world. And religion was all over that, right? That women's role as nurturers, as keepers of the family flame was godly. Um, and so the Catholic Church in particular, but they were certainly not the only ones reinforce this idea that uh, if you cared about family, if you cared about home values, you were anti-suffrage. 
All right. Well, Rebecca, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Um, the the first I think is very interesting that the, the first election that women were able to participate in a hundred years ago was November second. Am I right? And uh, and they elected Warren Harding, so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not get too excited about women's vote at the top, but yeah. Uh, well, so this year it'll be 100 years and one day before, you know, that, that we'll next go to, to the polls, so. Um. And, and I, you know, I don't want to end on a down note. I want to end by saying, go vote. I mean, don't just vote this year. Vote in the weird off your school board elections. Vote. <laughs> Think how incredibly hard our foremothers work to make sure that we have that right. Go do it. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, just a couple of notes for, for everybody who's tuning in. Um, this um, program will has been recorded and it will be uploaded to the WIPS YouTube channel. So if you'd like to share it with someone, if you just go to YouTube and you search, search for WIPS, W-I-P-P-S, you will find it there. Um, after a couple of days, I, I'll, I'm not quite sure how long it'll take us to get it there. Uh, I did include in the chat a link to the Central Wisconsin Book Festival survey. If you wouldn't mind clicking on that, it'll take about a minute and a half to uh, complete that survey. And that is much appreciated by the organizers. And this, as I said at the beginning, this was the first of a two-part series. Our second event will be coming up on October 7th. It is a panel discussion. Uh, we're calling Civically Engaged Wisconsin Women Past, Present, and Future. And we've got a fantastic uh, group of women who will be sharing some about the history of women in Wisconsin, as well as, you know, um, what's, what, what lies ahead for women here. So we'll have Kathy Evers, the First Lady, um, Su uh, Supreme Court Justice Ann Walsh Bradley, Simone Munson from the Wisconsin Historical Society, Shannon Halsey, who is the president of the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohican Indians. And the entire event will be moderated by Wisconsin Public Television's Mar Marissa Wojcik. And if you go to our website, whips.org, you will find um, information, more information about this event and a link to click on to join us that evening. So. Again, uh, many thanks to Rebecca Boggs Roberts and to everyone who's here tonight. Um, have a good evening. <laughs>